Why do you think the mainstream media hasn't had much interest in covering your story? Uh, because I'm a federal government employee speaking out against the federal government. Probably has something to do with it. Um, this is being tied to the Freedom Convoy, which has since been vilified in, um, in, in the traditional media. Um, it's more than likely, you know, there are various reasons, but I think it has to do with um, a lot of the measures, including the vaccination policy. Um, I think it can be verifiably proved that they have done uh, more harm than good, or at least um, the implementation of these policies um, were not as effective as was made out to be. And you have this in this institutional mind, this inability to kind of come to grips with uh, the fact that it has made a mistake. And it's not going to admit that it has made a mistake. So, I mean, <clears throat> um, they also, you know, the, the, it's just the, it's the media and the political landscape, the way it is and the way it's, it's been melded together in the recent years, too. Um, you know, this kind of dissent is not allowed. And um, however, because I'm not, you know, really breaking any laws so as such, the way that this is being handled is to ignore it. With all the people that I came into contact with who wanted to help out with all of this, it became evident that we were going to have to make a, um, to make this known to the Canadian public. And they were, uh, through social media, we were able to make this, this journey known to them. As we got closer and closer, it became harder and harder to ignore. I think at the outset, I could understand why somebody would think that, okay, well, you know, this is just some stunt or this is just uh, uh, um, an attempt to get attention. But as they, as I got, you know, as we got further and further along, it became evident that, you know, we we're 100% completely serious about completing this journey. And it became harder to ignore. And I think there's a number of uh, factors and reasons involved there. Um, you know, I don't want to speculate too much on it or um, theorize, okay? But ultimately, you know, this is something that I think I would like to kind of this whole thing and the way it was ignored to use that as an object lesson into, you know, the mainstream media is um, it's useful in some things, but not so useful and beneficial in other things. And we're really what we we're able to, to do to get out to get the story out there about what we we're doing was appeal to people directly by being visible on the on the highway. Because at some level, I knew it was going to be ignored. That was the point of it. That was why I was marching into on the Trans Canada Highway, so people would see what I was doing. And you can't, you can't deny that. Yeah, the logistics were we had to account for how we're going to get across the mountains and the prairies. Um, so there's a number of things you have to consider, right? Like, OK, so who's your personnel? Who do you have available? What are they capable of? Um, the vehicles, the number of vehicles, fuels you, you, to, uh, that you're going to require, um, food that you're going to require, funding, um, and, and also coordinating that with the, with the online team to you know, come up with a plan on how we're going to message this. And... Um, so what, who I had helping me with Christian George, after, uh, who was, you know, this is again, this is one of the things that is remarkable about this trip because I had not known him before February the 20th. So, you know, when I had made my initial announcement on February the 12th, I had invited anybody who thinks they would like to participate for, you know, however long they think they could. Not really realizing or knowing how many people would, how far they would want to go and um, how we were going to sustain that. I knew I was going to go as far as hope, and I knew that um, you know that I had I had some places to stay along the way, and then hope was going to be kind of base camp before we hit the mountains, and I would be able to iron out a number of wrinkles along the way, right? So it, you know when I got to the Terry Fox Memorial on the 20th of February, there was a whole pile of people there to see me off, and then I met um, Dan and Dallas, Jeremy and Dave. And, um, you know, they're the ones that got us from, 
out of Vancouver, right? And like I said, it was like one of these things, like I'm not a particularly uh, outgoing um, or, or, or uh, extroverted type person, but it was, you know, I, I met all these folks and, you know, on the very first day and we, we marched uh, 50 kilometers that day, actually all the way from um, the Terry Fox statue to, to the Olympian gym in, in Maple Ridge. And, you know, we had upwards of, at the start, probably about 60 or 70 people. And then it ended with probably 30 or 40, including a woman who had uh, just um, overcome uh, a type of brain cancer. So it really spoke to the level of commitment that people have towards, you know, what I was doing and, and what they feel the whole thing was about. And um, yeah, a really, a really amazing uh, experience that first day. So going into Hope, now we had taken a couple of days to reorient ourselves and get ready for the next leg of the trip and there was that there was about eight of us all together and like i said from there we had a kind of a plan on how to address you know food fuel accommodations personnel management and i have a background in this kind of thing because that's what i did in the army for you know a better part of my adult life so we had you know an rv and a, and a vehicle and you know we were able to march to one location uh stop for the day then, uh, you know, drive to the place where somebody was going to put us up, maybe sleep in their basement or they put some funds together to get us into a motel and then drive back to where we stopped. So it always went like that. And then on a daily basis, it was typically get up at about six or six thirty, have some breakfast, drive out to the place where we stopped the day before and resume the march from the place we, we stopped. And then we used the RV as a as a kind of mobile support unit to provide resting spots along the way because I, I, I've done this kind of thing before and but not for such a sustained period of time and you have to use this kind of disciplined approach where you're not just marching until you drop right you march for 45 minutes or an hour take a break for 10 minutes and then and then you carry on and so we were able to use the vehicles as safety with flashers and then we use the support vehicle like the RV to bound ahead like three to five kilometers and then march up to it have some water, have some food, and then leapfrog that way. In Coaldale, Alberta, that was, you know, one of those days where I had, I'm um, wondering, okay, what am I doing here? Why did I do it? You know, and uh, can I do it? And I wouldn't say it was like, you know, this, uh, another despair or anything like that, but definitely it was a dark, dark, one of the darker days. And I remember looking down uh, the road and seeing a gentleman approach me. His name's Brent Ginther and he's from Coaldale, Alberta. And uh, he's a vet, he, he introduced himself and you know, he said, this is a really important thing that you're doing. And that is one of the things that jumped out at me right off the bat. And uh, you know, not long after that, I was, uh, you know, another, um, met another individual in a similar situation to I am who was on leave without pay from the federal government. You know, all these folks who had come forward to say that, uh, you know, this is important. This is important what you're doing. And, you know, that was, that was the first part. Like, I mean, there was times, definitely when you're doing this kind of activity, you have this roller coaster ride of um, physical and emotional reaction. And, you know, there were some days it was just a slog and somebody, you know, it always seemed like somebody would drive up and say, hey, you know, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And, um, and always, it always seemed to happen at the right time. It was really, I'm not particularly spiritual or religious, but you know, like I said, there's something, there was something going on there. So the goal was, <clears throat> I think, because it initially was to have this meeting so I could air my, my, my grievances and tell them about the damage that has been done by the implementation of these policies, specifically the one that is um, denying people a paycheck or releasing them from their armed forces or causing them to, you know, lose their livelihood. So, you know, this disturbed me. There's a lot of folks who want to leave the country. They were leaving Ontario to go to live in Alberta. I mean, it was just, I'm seeing this unhappiness and this level of dissatisfaction with everybody that I had met, you know, who are saying, you know, this is good what you're doing, 
but they're also unhappy with the this current state of affairs with what they see as um, them being they've lost hope in the system they feel powerless so that became a, that became a, something i wanted to communicate to our members of parliament i wanted to help them in a way demonstrate to canadian people that the system can work if you put some time and energy into it so ultimately i think the meeting was successful because members of parliament showed up despite the backlash that they were going to experience within within the traditional media trying to use this as a wedge issue uh, because the members of parliament that did choose to attend were largely from the conservative party even though i did have a representative from the ndp uh, indicate that he was going to attend i mean i, I he but I, I did not attend the actual meeting so to to that point i would say that i think they i was it was successful in that through uh, reaching out to them uh, reaching out to them through their constituents asking their constituents that if they believed in what i was doing and what you know it was worth their time they should write a letter to their members of parliament and show that the system can work it just takes effort and it, it takes concerted effort and perseverance right and what happened was I had the meeting and it was, you know, like they, they showed up, like I said, despite this kind of divisive political landscape we're in and the media backlash they were going to experience, they showed up and they weathered the storm afterward because there was a backlash and it was painted out to be some kind of, um, you know, conservative movement. But the fact of the matter is that, and everybody needs to understand this clearly, that a letter went out to every single member of parliament and senator in the house of commons and i have all of the documentation to show that so 338 members of parliament should have received this letter in both an email and a mailed letter and we, we we videotaped us early on writing signing sealing mailing the letters this was the point of it we're reaching out to every single one of them the fact that only members of the conservative party showed up I don't know what that demonstrates, but it definitely shows who, you know, who the, those who didn't show up didn't want to hear what I had to say. And um, I think that's also um, an object lesson in and of itself. There was no representation across the board with the, the political parties, which is unfortunate. So, however, the meeting was had. That part of it I showed at least in some way, shape, or form, Canadian public does have an influence in what happens in politics. They just have to work at it. And then I needed to, I, I was, it was successful for me too because I was able to present them with some kind of solutions, right? I didn't just go there and bang the table. I went there saying, this is the situation in the country, here's a potential solution. And we called it the three plus R's or three R equation. You know, you re, uh, <clears throat> repeal the mandates. Uh, that's why I had Dr. Paul Alexander there with me as, a, as an authority figure on this aspect to show that the mandates put in place um, are doing more than likely doing more harm than good. Uh, reinstate government employees, uh, will reinstate all employees and grant some restitution for the wages lost and that's gonna equal repair to the damage that's been done to the Canadian society because I think we're still highly divided and we're living in an, uh, an environment of, of fear that's been uh, perpetuated by, you know, the reporting on this, you know, the pandemic and COVID and everything around it, including um, this, this, this kind of movement that's been born out of the, the protests in January. So this is a this is divide that continues to be um, fertilized by the by the by the corporate media unfortunately and i i was wanting to say okay so this is an effort for you to demonstrate to the canadian public that we still have a democracy that functions let's get together with canadian citizens and have this conversation and that was had and i was able to say that and then propose you know a way forward for all of this in the formation of you know some kind of citizens citizens organization where we can have constructive relationship with our federal government I had a uh, idea in my mind that there might be a few people arriving and seeing, uh, meeting me there. And then I thought, I, I really, I don't, in some way I was a little bit pleasantly surprised at the amount of support that we did get. 
Um, and the, the way it all went down, and it did, like I said, it wasn't about just what I did, it was I had the, uh, the help of veterans and other, and other folks who came in to help us guide all those people in, right? Like, I mean, it wasn't, uh, it was a bit of a challenge. At one point in time, we had a uh, 1,000 people or, or close to it marching and then, um, you know, in, in a formation that was almost a kilometer long. So to get all of those folks across intersections, and, and I'd also like to add that, you know, we worked in full cooperation with Ottawa Police Service. And um, I was very thankful for their, for their participation. So, like, I mean, we were not in opposition with each other, to each other. Like, they fully enabled that march to, to be successful through the city. And I was, thank, I was glad they were there. So the, all of this stuff came together because we all worked in, in co-op. We all cooperated. Like, everybody who was there wanted to be there. Everybody was willing to listen to instructions. They, they knew the purpose of it, why I was doing what I was doing. And... Um, it ultimately, it was, you know, one of the most amazing experiences of my life, to be honest. And then it's unfortunate that we have this media that is focused on the negative aspect of this as opposed to what an amazing event it actually was. Because, in the, you know, for me to go up there and put my hand on that tomb and be able to show all of everybody that, you know, you put your mind to it, you can get things accomplished. Like, I didn't jump over the moon, but this was, um, you know, I got there with the help of everybody. And to put my hand on that monument was a pretty amazing experience. And then, uh, yeah, well, that was that. I mean, I said a few words and here we are. Everybody uh, had a good weekend so far. I think they celebrated Canada Day. And, well, I, I hope that we are able to overcome this divide that, we've been, that, we, that has been introduced in our society. Um, I think that what ended up happening was, um, you know, we had so much fear and alarm transmitted through the airwaves and in almost every aspect of the media. So what I would like to see happen is for us to be able to reach across this divide. And um, like I said, with respect and honesty, uh, we communicate with each other and um, that's what I would like to see happen. Like, I mean, this is a country that was built because we, we were able to achieve certain things together. Like, you know, the, the, the railway that connects the country, um, you know, in the 19th century, that, that was done in cooperation so that you could travel from east to west and you know you have a Trans-Canada Highway that connects us in a way too and in that way we that you know we built that the Canadian people built that together it didn't just you know put itself there so that's in that vein you know I kind of see that is is the way forward right like we recognize what needs to happen here I had I had proposed in my meeting with members of parliament that there's, a, there's an imbalance and the, 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 we need to restore the balance between what is happening at the federal government level and the provincial government level too, to some extent, by putting more ability in the hands of the Canadian people to have influence on policies that are put in place. So, you know, to say that we want to help the Canadian public as taxpayers, as voters, to become more educated, to be involved in the system, because there's that level of disenfranchisement and hopelessness that I think they felt. But we want to be able to help them, um, you know, restore their, their faith in these institutions by participating in them, because that's what we have. We just, uh, people feel that their votes don't count and then they just stop voting or they stop participating in the process. And in order for this to work, they need to participate in the process. In the same way, we built the roads and highways and power lines and everything else that, uh, that this country is, um, keeps this country together.